welcome back. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to try to get an understanding of the structure of a protein chain as it relates to the mechanism of proteases. We're also going to define exactly what a protease is and we're going to try to determine the differences between N-terminal proteases and C-terminal proteases. Also, proteases can be usually uh, differentiated into two different groups. Those are serine proteases and cysteine proteases. We'll try to distinguish between those. We're also going to try to understand how to determine strategies for determining the mechanism of certain proteases because what will happen in classes is you won't always be given a protease that you have seen before. So if you understand how to go about determining the strategy, it'll make things a lot easier. Also, we want to understand how the active site works for various types of proteases. What I've done for you here is I've drawn a hypothetical protein chain. Over here on the right side, we have the N, oops, let me get my right tool. We have the N terminus, okay? And as we move along here, this right here is just the rest of the protein chain. It's gonna be a much larger protein than I'm going to draw here, but this will be the, it will at least lead to the C terminus, okay? And what we're gonna do in this part of the video is we're gonna to try to get an intuitive sense of exactly um, what the setup is for the mechanism. Okay, now what I've done here is I've drawn um, an aspartate residue. You might recognize this as an aspartate R group, okay, and that's what it is. And it turns out that in the mechanism that we're going to do first, um, it turns out that the protease, which is called a caspase, is going to specifically target um, the part of the protein chain that has aspartate residues, okay? And we're not going to actually do the mechanism in this video. We'll do that in the next video, but we're at least going to get the setup for determining how to go about looking for the strategy to do it, okay? Now, I also have several other amino acids, and they really could be a number of things depending on the caspase, but we have over here on the left, we have amino acid A, and then we have amino acid B, Here's the, here's the aspartate residue, then amino acid D and E and so forth. And what I want to point out to you also is that generally when we draw a protein structure, we draw it from N to C terminus. That's just the convention. And part of the reason that we draw it that way is because when you synthesize the protein by the ribosome, it is synthesized from N to C terminus. Okay. Now, part of the strategy for looking at um, what the mechanism is, is to actually look at the name of the enzyme. Um, a lot of times what will happen is the actual enzyme name will give you a lot of clues as to what the mechanism is. For instance, the mechanism that we're going to look at is the general mechanism for something referred to as a caspase. And what caspases are, are they, they are apoptotic enzymes. So they're enzymes that begin the process of apoptosis when a cell needs to commit suicide. And these particular enzymes are cysteine proteases. Um, eventually, we'll, we'll, we'll learn to distinguish between the two classes of proteases, cysteine proteases and serine proteases. Okay? Um, the difference is that the nucleophile is different between the two. Okay? Now, um, caspases, their name comes from the fact that they are C-terminal, C-terminal aspartate proteases. Okay, so sometimes uh, the name of the of the protein, and ordinarily what will have to happen is the teacher, whoever's teaching it, will have to give this information to you. Um, they couldn't just expect you to know that caspase is a C-terminal aspartate protease, but the name or the information they give you will give you a hint. For instance, um, we know from the name of this enzyme that it's going to target aspartate residues. Okay, and that's the reason that I've drawn the aspartate residue as amino acid C. Also, it's a C-terminal hydrolase, and we know that because it's going to target the C-terminal peptide bond. And we'll go into more information on that later. Okay? Now, part of the strategy in uh, doing these types of problems in determining the mechanism of an unknown protein is you need to identify the alpha carbon in question. Okay, so for instance, we know that this particular enzyme targets aspartate residues. There are many other uh, proteins that you can talk about. For instance, um, chymotrypsin is the one that's typically given in books. Chymotrypsin targets residues that are tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. 
um, basically your aromatics with the exception of histidine. So when you're looking at places where chymotrypsin would cleave, you would look for those three residues. In this case, caspases target aspartate residues, so that's the one we're going to look for. And what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and we're going to label the alpha carbon. Okay. So this carbon right there, and actually let me go and highlight it just so you know exactly what we're talking about. The carbon that I've highlighted there in purple, that's our alpha carbon. Okay. Now let's do this. Let's come down here. And actually let me, yeah, let me come down here. And what I'm going to do for you is in the same confirmation that this particular group right here, I'm going to circle what I'm talking about. It's this part right here. In the same confirmation that I've drawn it there, I'm going to draw the free amino acid aspartate. Okay. So the free amino acid aspartate, recall that it would essentially be the carboxylate and the amine with the positive charge. And then you would have your R group that sticks off. Okay. So I've essentially drawn it in the same conformation, the same shape that it exists here, except for the fact that I've drawn it as a free amino acid. Now notice this. Notice that over here on the left side, okay, we have the end terminus of the amino acid, and I'll label that in yellow. On the right side over here, we have the C terminus, and I'm going to label that in light blue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to label it the same way up here. Okay, so that carbon that I labeled in blue, that's this carbon right there. Okay, The nitrogen amine, which is now tied up in a peptide bond, I'm going to do it in yellow, that's this nitrogen right here. Okay, Now notice what happens when the ribosome synthesizes the proteins. The nitrogen that I've labeled in yellow gets tied up in a peptide bond. Okay. Likewise, the carboxyl side of, of the aspartate residue, the carboxyl side gets tied up in a peptide bond as well. And one of the things that we need to understand about proteases is they're targeting a specific type of carboxylic acid derivative that you should have learned about in organic, and that's called an amide. Okay. Let me draw a generic amide. What I'm going to draw right now is called N-methylacetamide. Okay. This right here is N-methylacetamide, and if we were to actually look at what the peptide bond is, okay, the peptide bond is essentially, actually let me do it like this, it's basically this bond right here, okay, the bond between that nitrogen and the carbon of the carbonyl, that's your peptide bond, and in fact, um, it's an amide bond, and when the, when the hydrolases get a hold of this protein, they're specifically going to cleave this bond. Okay, so what we need to do um, before we even look at the mechanism is we need to determine where the carboxylic acid derivative bonds are. In this case, they're amide bonds. And in the context of proteins, they are peptide bonds. Okay, so let me do this in, we'll do this in green because I haven't used green yet. So we're going to look at the, at the peptide bonds with respect to this alpha carbon that we've already labeled. Okay? So if we look at the N-terminal peptide bond, that's this bond right there. That's that bond right there. Okay? And then if we look at the C-terminal peptide bond, okay, it's this bond right there. And the reason I knew that was the C-terminal bond is it was... It was uh, bound in the C on the C terminal side of the aspartate residue where I labeled this carbon in blue. I knew that the other one was the N terminal peptide bond because that particular peptide bond contained the N terminus of the free aspartate, which I labeled in yellow. Okay. So now the the question is this: Which one of those peptide bonds is going to get hydrolyzed? And the way you go about looking for that is you look to see what type of protease it is. In the case of the caspase, it is a C-terminal aspartate protease. So I know now that the bond that's going to get hydrolyzed is this one that I'm highlighting in green. It's this one right here. It's the peptide bond on the C-terminal side of the alpha carbon of the aspartate residue. Okay. And so now we have decided at this point which of those bonds is going to be hydrolyzed. It's basically the one on the right. Okay. And in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at the mechanism 
of the cast space, okay? And remember that that's a C-terminal hydrolase, okay? In a later video, we're actually going to look at an N-terminal hydrolase. An example of an N-terminal hydrolase would be aspartate N-protease, okay? That's one that they often give in books, but we can certainly look at others as well. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're actually going to take a look at the structure of the active site. And actually, let's actually do... Um, Actually, let's do the cysteine protease first, okay? This is the general setup for your cysteine protease. So right here, okay, right here I have my cysteine residue. And notice how the cysteine residue is a thiol, okay? The thiol group is, of course, the group containing the sulfur and the hydrogen, okay? Also called a sulfhydryl group. Also in the active site, you have this histidine residue. And notice what's happening. This histidine residue on this particular nitrogen, it has a proton on it. And because of a dipole moment, and we can draw the dipole moment like this, the electron density is moving towards that nitrogen because the nitrogen is electronegative. And because of that dipole moment, the hydrogen gets a partial positive charge. Okay. Now what I want to make clear right now is this carbonyl that's right here, okay, this carbonyl is part of the protein, is part of the protein backbone, okay. So this, this carbonyl would be part of the amide linkage. This is part of the amide linkage. And also because oxygen is electronegative, you also have a dipole moment. But in this case, the dipole moment points towards the oxygen because the oxygen is more electronegative. And because of the dipole moment and difference in electronegativity, the oxygen gets a partial negative charge. And there's an electrostatic interaction between the partial positive of that hydrogen and the partial negative of the oxygen. It's a simple electrostatic hydrogen bond. Okay. What's the purpose of this? Well, as we'll see in the in the serine protease um, active site, it's going to serve the same purpose. Okay. Um, notice how notice how this particular let me label this this particular carbon has free rotation about uh, about it. Um, and so what can happen is in the absence of this particular carbonyl right here, the histidine can rotate uh, basically 360 degrees, okay? But what this carbonyl does is it bonds electrostatically with this hydrogen through hydrogen bonding, and it holds the histidine in a certain um, orientation. And the orientation is such to where this lone pair on this shift base can come and abstract the proton from the sulfhydryl group, and then these electrons can come and act as a nucleophile and attack a positively charged electrophile. In the context of the cysteine protease mechanism, the electrophile is the carbonyl carbon of that peptide bond. So that particular carbon that I'm referring to is this one that I'm highlighting. Um, we can make the same argument in the uh, serine protease active site. And by the way, I might also mention this. Uh, we already mentioned it uh, before, but it's worth mentioning again. The main cysteine protease um, uh, enzymes that you'd be uh, concerned about in the context of biochemistry or your biology classes would be caspases. And caspases are your enzymes that induce apoptosis, okay? However, our serine proteases occupy a much larger um, um, conglomerate of enzymes in the human body. For instance, um, all of your major digestive enzymes like chymotrypsin, trypsin, carboxypeptidases, endopeptidases, um, uh, pepsin, all of these enzymes are serine proteases. Okay. And again, they're going to target carboxylic acid derivatives known as amides. Okay. But in the context of proteins, they're called peptide bonds. Other very important examples of serine proteases are going to be complement proteins like C4, C3, and so forth, and your coagulation cascade enzymes. Okay. Now, the active site of a serine protease is very, very similar to that of a cysteine protease, except for the fact that here, instead of having a cysteine residue, you have a serine residue. Okay. Now, one thing I want to make perfectly clear about the serine residue is that it's going to behave very similarly to a 
a, uh, the serine residue is going to behave very similar, similarly to the cysteine residue. If you were to look at the periodic table, if you go across, you have the 5A group, you have the 6A group, and you have the 7A group, and so forth. In the 6A group, the top element is going to be oxygen, right? And below that, you have sulfur and selenium, okay? And because these atoms exist in the same group, they're going to exhibit similar characteristics, okay? These are all members of the chalcogen group, okay? And oxygen is part of serine, and sulfur is part of cysteine. And so, as a result, they're going to exhibit similar characteristics, like their ability to be good nucleophiles when deprotonated. Okay. Um, in the case of the cysteine protease, we also had the histidine residue, but in the case of the cysteine protease, okay, we had the carbonyl uh, on the peptide backbone that served as the Lewis, um, or excuse me, as the, um, as the hydrogen bond acceptor. Um, in the case of the serine protease, it's going to be a critical aspartate residue that's going to serve as the hydrogen bond acceptor, but it's still going to function in the exact same way. The aspartate residue forms an electrostatic interaction with the proton on that histidine residue, and it's able to form a hydrogen bond, and it holds the histidine in a certain orientation in close proximity to the serine residue. As a result, this shift base can deprotonate the serine, and these electrons come out and attack this electrophile, which in the case of a, um, a peptide a bond, it's the carbonyl carbon that's part of the peptide bond. Okay, So I hope this gave you a little bit of intuition on the serine, act, a serine protease active site and the cysteine protease active site. And once you know this information, then you can go about determining the mechanism of your enzyme. Remember that we were dealing with a caspase, and that's a C-terminal aspartate protease. In the context of this enzyme, it's going to hydrolyze the bond that I determined in green. Okay. Now, one thing that's also really important to mention is that hydrolases, and, and I should be really specific that we're talking about um, proteases that hydrolyze amide linkages, Okay. They only hydrolyze amide linkages. So the following bonds that I'm about to point to do not get hydrolyzed. So for instance, this bond right there does not get hydrolyzed, and this bond right there does not get hydrolyzed. So I'll put big X's there to signify that those bonds do not get hydrolyzed. Okay? So the only bonds that are getting hydrolyzed are peptide linkages, also referred to as amide linkages, in the context of carboxylic acid derivatives. Okay? In the next video, we'll actually look at the mechanism of the caspase. Okay? And um, after that video, we'll look at the mechanism of an N-terminal protease. See you in the next video.